This episode is brought to you by TikTok for Business. Brat summer is over, but TikTok for Business is just getting started. Whether your marketing goals are brand performance or full funnel related, leverage TikTok for Business's insights to drive business growth. Learn more at tiktok.com slash business. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Banking and Payment Show, a behind-the-numbers podcast from eMarketer made possible by TikTok. Today is October 8th, 2024. I'm Rob Rubin, Head of Business Development at eMarketer and your host. Today, I'm joined by two great analysts at eMarketer, Jacob Bourne, who follows developments in AI, and Grace Broadbent, who follows the payment industry. Hey, guys, how are you doing? Pretty good, Rob. Thanks for having me today. Thanks, Jacob. Hi, Grace. Hello, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to have you guys here. Let me ask you guys an icebreaker question. How much of your day is spent interacting with an LLM like OpenAI, ChatGPT, or Claude? So, you know, really good question. Um, I haven't timed it yet, but it's probably become more over time just because of the nature of my work as a tech analyst have to be using the technologies that we Mm -hmm. research. So it it kind of goes with the territory. So you're doing it for work, but do you do it for any personal stuff? Yeah. I mean, occasionally it comes up with good answers to, you know, casual questions about, um, you know, things that just would be difficult to search and find using traditional search methods. Yeah. I find that I'm looking at Gemini a lot now. Mm Mm-hmm. You know, when I'm Googling and then I see that and I read that response. Yes. Grace, what about you? I agree. I feel like I've been looking at Gemini a lot when I do just any kind of Google search. I don't use it too often, though. I'm probably more limited than Jacob. Mm -hmm. I've been playing around with it some, but I probably only use it once, twice a week and mainly for work purposes, nothing personal yet. Mm. All right. Just trying to take everyone's temperature. Today's subject is the risks of AI to financial institutions. Jacob, the last time you were on this podcast, we were talking about the opportunities financial institutions have for AI. So before we talk about all the different categories of risk, let's start with the headlines to get us into the topic. In the headlines, I pick an article that's related, and there's a link in the show notes for the article itself. For today's headline, I chose an article on BBC.com, Could AI Trading Bots transform the world of investing. And the reason I chose it is because it gets to the heart of a lot of these risk-related issues. And at the heart of it is, is that AI bots are ultimately making decisions autonomously. Mm -hmm. So they, they are listening to what you say and making a decision by themselves. So Grace, what could go wrong? (laughs) Oh goodness. So much. So much could go wrong, Rob. (laughs) I mean, AI is subject to hallucinations, biases, inaccuracies, you name it. There's all sorts of problems. And this is scary for investments because a lot of times people's money, future savings are the things at stake and that can go so wrong so badly. Right. And all of the due diligence that's necessary behind the scenes to get the right data. And if you're acting on if they're actually giving you the wrong data, how do you even know where to look? Yeah. I mean, I think a central issue here is just accountability. I mean, if, if a person mm-hmm. breaks a banking law or, you know, someone working in the industry makes an error, well, they either face legal consequences or lose their job. But if AI is a lawbreaker or making the error, well, then who's responsible for that? And I think, you know, it could be, you know, is it the de- developer of the AI model itself? Is it the company deploying the AI model? Is it the wa- person using the interface? And I don't think that there's great answers to any of those questions, at least not yet. It seems like it should be the company that is providing the incorrect information. They're responsible. I mean, it could be. I think no? it depends on the particular instance and, and what happened. Mm. But, you know, I think that the ultimately the states, stakes are high here because without accountability and a good system for established established accountability, then it's really have, hard to have public trust in right. institutions that are, that are using generative AI. You know, one of the, because we're talking about investing here, one of the challenges that comes up a lot with AI is the bias, mm-hmm. right? So they're making investment decisions and there's an inherent bias to the decisions that they might choose to make. How does that get overcome? 
Yeah. Does it? I mean, it's a lot of it goes back to having quality training data mm. that, that you don't, you're not training AI models using data that's, you know, bias, for example, not using data that's really representative of demographic, you know, the full demographic scope of your consumer, right. consumer base, but, for example. But, it, you know, it's a, it's a technical, I think it's a deeper technical issue than that too. And, you know, I think it's something like with hallucinations, you know, tech companies are working on it, but can you get to hundred percent resolution of the problem? And if so, when does that happen? But can they be smarter than a developers? Like how does AI overcome its developers weaknesses? Well, I think it, it can and it can't. I mean, in the sense that it can is a sense that generative AI is a type of AI that can learn and it has these so-called emergent capabilities that allows it to act outside of its programming, at least for like the most advanced uh -huh. models. And it's also trained on data that's so vast that's beyond the awareness. I mean, the, the people, the developers making these models aren't fully aware of every data point that's going right. into training the models. So in that sense, yeah, the models are, they're capable in, in, in certain respects beyond the people who train them. And I think we have to remember here when we're talking about developers, we're talking about a team of people. Right. And so if one person on the team has a limitation, probably not a big deal, but if the entire team has a systemic bias or has a blind spot in terms of how they're building the model, well, then that could be a, a big issue and could, could ultimately, I would say in, in that sense, then no, the model can't probably overcome the weaknesses there. So it's going to really be a situation where it's going to be hard for us to know where the weaknesses are until they're discovered. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that's a big issue is when people are looking through like how AI makes decisions is we don't even know exactly how they are. Like the developers working on it can't tell you exactly how the AI came to this decision. So how do you figure out what the bias is if you don't know how they made the decision? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a really crucial point, Grace, is that we can't see the chain of thought between the input and the output. And when you have, you know, someone's credit application being decided by an AI bot, well, you kind of really want to know how the decision is being made, but you can't really at this point. Right. But to give somebody uh, information to execute a trade that's wrong or to make a recommendation on a series of stocks that there's a bias to why you're making that, to why the AI is making those recommendations, mm -hmm. All that could actually just stop the industry in its tracks. No? I mean, it's it's here, though, and, and it seems like right. we're, we're using it, right? So the industry is using it. But are they using it to make – they are using it to make investment decisions right now. But are they actually executing? I think something interesting to think about pivoting that a little bit is we said, can AI be like overcome developers' issues? But can AI even – predict the future, predict investment decisions better than a human, a trader can, you know, like AI doesn't have any knowledge that humans don't have. So can they be smarter than the human? That's really the question yeah. at stake in terms of investment. They didn't predict the pandemic, right? Like, yeah. like those sort of things which create sea change or, you know, just a tremendous change. It, has, it wasn't able to predict that. I mean, I think we also have to make a distinction between predictive AI and generative AI. And I think we're increasingly seeing them being uh, used yeah, in tandem point. with each other. The models are getting more advanced. And I think the pr predictive capabilities will increase. But I think it's also important to note that, I mean, one human being also can't think with the same computational speed with the same amount of data, like instant recall to the same kind of data that an AI model can with the same speed. That's not to say that AI is not going to make a ton of mistakes. It does. But in terms of like healthcare, like diagnosing conditions, AI has proven to right. be very accurate um, in terms of, uh, you know, predictions. So I think the potential is there. But I think also, just to be fair, people also sometimes can't give a logical explanation for their decisions as well. So the human brain can kind of be a black box in a way as well. I mean, we make a lot of our decisions based on intuition. Right. So there's that aspect as well. This is an excellent time to transition because I wanted to use the headlines to get us sort of warmed up into the topic. And I think what we've learned is that there's a lot to cover here in terms of all the risks 
that a bank can make. So in our final segment, we're gonna do something we haven't done in a while, which is something we call the rankings. Prior to recording this show, I shared a list of five AI sort of risk categories that financial institutions must address. And we each rank them in terms of importance. And I'm going to read the list and then we can go around and see what we ranked as one, two, et cetera, and then we'll discuss. So let me just read the list and then Grace, I'll get to yours first. The first on the list is cybersecurity. So things like an AI powered cyber attack. Number two is frauds. So deep fakes, automated money laundering, those kinds of things. The third is regulatory compliance risks, bias, which we've talked about, fairness, opaqueness, just sort of covering all that. Fourth are sort of operational risks like systemic errors. And the fifth area is data privacy or security. So things like breaches, handling PII, and that sort of thing. So Grace, what was your number one? I said fraud. All right. Jacob, what did you do number one? I did cybersecurity as number one. Ah, okay. I did cybersecurity as number one as well. I'm the outlier. Yeah. Grace, what about number two? Uh, I put regulatory compliance. Ah. I put fraud for, as my number two. Ah, me too. Great. Now, what did you put number three, Grace? I have data privacy and security. And I have the same for my number three. Okay. So we're all the same for three. Okay. So we each have that. Grace, what did you choose as your fourth? I have four cybersecurity. And I have all regulatory right. and compliance as my fourth. And my fourth, I had regulatory and compliance challenges. So that was the same. It seems like so far, well, it seems like now I know for sure Jacob <laughs> right. and I were the same. <laughs> yes, um, and, I'm the, yeah. and Grace, you, we all had operational as the last one. Yes. I did, yeah. yes. Okay. So let's talk about, like, to me, this is really interesting, actually. So Jacob and I put cybersecurity mm -hmm. as first. And Grace, you had it fourth. You got to tell did. us, like, why is cybersecurity, obviously all these things are super important, but mm -hmm. why is it not as important as these other things? I don't think it's a matter that cybersecurity isn't important. I think fraud is just so extremely important and so top of mind, especially as I come from the payments world. And it is just, mm -hmm. I think, I mean, obviously all five are extremely important and we should be concerned about them all. But to me, fraud is top of mind. And I think to show how top of mind it is for financial institutions, particularly payment providers. You can just look at the headlines the past like two, three weeks. Both Visa and MasterCard made billion dollar or multi-billion dollar fraud acquisitions specifically right. mm -hmm. to fight AI fraud. And that's not a coincidence that they both happened so recently. Yeah. So Visa bought Future Space for almost one billion. MasterCard bought Recorded Future for two point six five billion, and that was both in the past month. Yeah, and Grace, I think that's a fair analysis, just because fraud is something that's almost you know nonstop. It's a nonstop issue. Um, cybersecurity. Yeah, I agree. I think it's yeah. an everyday issue for consumers. Yeah. I put cybersecurity, even though it's not you're not necessarily going to have a major breach every day when they do happen. And I think generate AI's ability to generate malicious code and also pinpoint weaknesses in security systems means that we have an existing problem with cybersecurity that caught it's so massively damaging financially and into organizations' reputations that I think that that could just escalate even more from generative AI and become yeah. a really catastrophic problem. I agree that it's like, you know, fraud is like the everyday problem, mm -hmm. but cybersecurity is the nightmare scenario, right. you know, the thing that shuts everybody down. And I think we've seen tastes of it where, you know, an intern by accident pushes code to production and takes down, like, didn't that happen with Microsoft? Like a whole bunch of stuff got taken mm -hmm. down mm -hmm. for Outlook. Yep. So, you know, like that wasn't even malicious. So that's why I put cybersecurity number one. And I think we kind of agree with you, Grace, and that fraud for both Jacob and I is number two, yeah. you know, like the idea of deep fakes, the ability for AI to figure out how to launder money better than the money launderers. Yeah. 
<laughs> and and I think with the the fraud and and the AI deep fakes, it's it's getting worse almost by the day as well because now you have these AI clones that are clones of people that are getting better, more realistic. So a clone that can sit on a Zoom meeting with you, you know, with coworkers, and it's not quite convincing, but it's getting there. And the audio deep fakes, you know, you have instances where you know someone's voice gets cloned, and then the bad actor calls a family member, says, "I'm in trouble, I need money." Um, these are really nightmare situations for individuals. So, you know, in general, AI just kind of enhances that that risk. Yeah. Now, Grace, I'm going to pick on you again because here's the other big Go difference: <laughs> regulatory. So, again, obviously, it's important. But Jacob and I put it at, at number four, and you said it was the second most important. So, we'd love to get your rationale. I'm again coming from the payments angle, consumer facing angle, because that is my bread and butter of what I look uh-huh, into every uh-huh. single day. And in terms of financial inclusion specifically, I just think the issues around bias and fairness is, is such a large concern. Biased AI systems result in unfair and discriminatory outcomes, whether it's denying a credit card application, a mortgage application, whatever mm. the case may be. It can really have big impacts on everyday consumer lives if they get it wrong. Yeah. And I think we can all be in agreement that all of these five are really serious issues and, and this one is no different. But I think the reason why I put it as my four is just because maybe the consequences aren't immediately catastrophic in the way that like a major cybersecurity incident is. Yeah. That's true. I think I'm, I'm looking at everything from more short-term lens mm-hmm. and you guys are looking at the long-term wider lens for sure. I feel like with regulatory, it sort of slows things down. It's like puts a spanner in the works and that it'll slow development down, maybe for a good thing. Or on the other side, something bad happens and then everybody gets locked down for a little while. Mm -hmm. But I just don't see it as if I'm ranking risk. I just don't put it up in the same area as, you know, a cybersecurity catastrophe that could really blow something up or you know, a data, a major data breach. Yeah. It's kind of more of a slow moving insidious problem than something that's immediately nightmarish. Right. And then the last one, which we all said the last one, probably the people at the banks are laughing that we put operation at last because <laughs> none of the others work without it. Um, right. <laughs> but, I, you know, obviously like systemic errors in your data sets or in your systems cause systemic problems. And that would be the biggest problem that we can occur. So I I just thought maybe I could quickly just review where we were at and maybe we can come up with sort of the ranking. Well, it's two against one right now. That's not fair. It's it's, it's more than two against one because I'm the host. Right. Yeah, it's really not working. I'm going to say fraud and cybersecurity are sort of a one and a half. I'm going to go there. But I do think that privacy and security are... I'm going to put above, I'm going to say. And the three of those are are closely related to is the other thing. Yeah. So it's like, you know, one and a half, Mm -hmm. one and a half, three, and then regulatory operational is four and five. Mm -hmm. So cybersecurity slash fraud, then privacy security, then regulatory and operational. So I I think we've solved some problems for people today, huh? Uh, Yeah. (laughs) I I think, uh, yeah, we came up with a good... uh, threat mitigation yeah. prioritization <laughs> list or something. Exactly. <laughs> I, I think so. I want to yeah. thank you guys for coming on today. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Thank you guys. Always fun. And I want to thank everyone for listening to the Banking and Payment Show, an e-marketer podcast made possible by TikTok. Also, thank you to our editor, Victoria. Our next episode is on November 12th, so be sure to check it out. See you then. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.